Welcome to the Music of America podcast, where every week we visit a different state in America and meet a different guest in the music industry. Every day, Monday through Friday. We begin in Alabama, and we end in Wyoming. I'm your host, Tom Pollard. Let's talk music here on the Music of America. And the Music of America podcast continues. We're in Marietta, Georgia, and our guest today is Deborah Cohen. Yes. Welcome to the Music of America podcast. Thank you're, you, Tom. You're you're interesting because I don't really know what how you define new wave music, but you used to be with a new wave band, and now you're doing DIY, which I guess you do you produce everything. Yes. And then you also have a style that you're promoting or that you're trying to get into called sync. Is that correct? Well, sync is really for uh, music supervisors that are shopping for TV, film, and movie music. Really? So, yeah, so it comes in any genre. It just depends on what the show requires. So, uh-huh. uh, it, you know, you have to kind of write a variety of music, which is what I do. Because that's where the money is. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. So do you write music and lyrics or just music? Or Yes, I uh, I write music. Well, actually, I dream music because I don't sit down and plan the song. I actually uh-huh. hear them from the muse during the daytime or in my dreams. And then I get up, hopefully, and write the lyrics when I hear them. But I've got a lot of songs that I've dreamt that I failed to get out of bed for, and they have just gone with the wind. They're just gone now. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting. So it actually begins in your head, because a lot of musicians will say it begins here. It begins in your heart, or uh, comes from your soul, comes from within. But yours is all in your head. Yeah. And then, and then your subconscious. The it comes from the spirit. Okay. Yeah. And it's then believe in that manifests yeah. in dreams, and then you wake up and take that manifestation and and put it into something tangible like musical notes. Yeah, I feel it after I hear it. I have to rush to my voice recorder so I don't forget it. And then I listen to it and feel what it's about, the song. And then I write the words that I'm feeling. Okay. So, and that didn't always, that wasn't always the case when I started off in my new wave band in the 80s in Boston, Massachusetts. I couldn't write a song to save my soul, but managed to pen a couple of them, one of which was on WBCN radio in Boston with Mark Parento for those of you that were in the music scene in the eighties, but um, it didn't start to come to me in my dreams. I was always fascinated with Paul McCartney because he talked about a lot of his songs he got in his dreams. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool to have that happen? It never happened to me. But after I changed my genre from new wave uh, which is like the Cars or, let's see, Robin Lane and the Chart Busters or, you know, I think Chrissy Hine, the Chrissy Pretender. Chrissy Hine's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, she was one of my favorites. And uh, I I went through a change uh, when I almost died from a drug overdose. And oh, uh, at that point, I mean, I wasn't a religious person at all. I lived like, a, you know, drugs blank and rock and roll <laughs> <laughs> but I, pro- I when i was uh checking out a little too early i said okay i looked up to the sky at a god i didn't know and said you know if you let me live i'll serve you and i really didn't know what i was saying but i just didn't want to die and mm-hmm. i lived so i started writing spiritual music so that that's when the dreams started coming to me the musical dreams that's so cool that that that's the avenue you wanted it to have happen. And you had to go through what you had to go through, I think, to get to that that plateau or that point in your life, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so true that as I've gotten older, uh, and I, I guess some people could call me an old hippie, but, um, you know, I I find that if you don't struggle a lot, then when you sing, you can tell if it's the person's trained voice singing or if it's their soul singing. Yeah. Like Amy Winehouse, she sang from her soul. She, mm-hmm. I mean, 
it's such a shame that she checked out, but she didn't make the drug overdose like I did. You know, she, I, I survived. But um, I think that you have to struggle a lot in life in order to have a depth of character. It's mm -hmm. not the way I would have chosen it, but most people are that I've met are full of love and appreciation and kindness if they've overcome their struggles. A lot of people, when they're struggling, they get stuck in it and they can't find their way out and they start becoming uh, a magnet for unhealthy people. And all they can talk about is me, me, me. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of people like that. And that's what happens if you can't find help. Yeah. But I, I went to the counseling, you know, I, for a long time <laughs> and uh, had to be treated for PTSD. For those of you out there that have anxiety problems, I know all about that. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, walk me through the journey that is Deborah Cohen's musical path. Like, when did you get started in music? What did you do? Were you surrounded by music as a child? And oh, of course. You know, anybody that's my age knows Ed Sullivan in the 60s and the Beatles. I mean, I, I, I draw people crazy with my Beatles. I mean, you know, like black and white TVs and a Polaroid camera in front, taking pictures of John Lennon's profile. <laughs> screaming. I was screaming with everybody else. All the teenagers, we screamed. It was called Beatlemania. And I'm so glad that I lived through that era because I developed my ears uh, for sound and music and create George Martin is the I still say hands down is the best producer ever but um and I always dreamed of him re producing one of my songs but it didn't happen yeah. you know and I also dreamed that Paul McCartney would marry me and I was so mad at him when he married Linda but that's because I was a silly teenager with a poster of Paul McCartney on my wall but that's what started me off and my mother wanted me to go to nursing school you know and two weeks before I started attending I said to myself what am I doing I'm this is what my parents want me to be I, I don't want to be that I want to be a musician so I withdrew my application moved to Brookline Massachusetts and went to the School of Contemporary Music in um, Massachusetts and as soon as they started doing the music theory I'm like man I don't get this and I found out I had dyslexia so I dropped out as soon as I could play rock and roll chords, one, four, five, nah, 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 nah. And I uh, <laughs> got into a band called MPC and the Instigators and uh, was the lead singer and the guitar player. And the highlight of that band was we got to open up for Joan Jett. Ah, oh, fun. <laughs> yes, I still remember her PF Flyer sneakers there. But uh, yeah, but she, uh, she obviously took the right road. She's still going strong, which you got to give her a lot of credit for. Uh, what was it? Uh, is she playing now with Joe Jackson or one of them people? Somebody. I just saw that like just last week or two weeks ago. I'm um, like, oh my was God. Was it Rick, Rick Springfield maybe? I, I don't I, I don't know. It was one of them. But, you know, I thought, man, you know. And, you know, this was at the time in the 80s when uh, U2 was the billboard at the Paradise for those of you who know the music scene in Boston. And, you know, we were, our my band, the, we rode by the Paradise billboard and kind of snickered at you too. We're, th we're so full of ourselves. We thought we were going to be that big someday, but there was just so much, so much free lines and so much Dom Perignon and all those things, uh, traps. And I just really fell into it because I was a mess anyway. You know, it just it was a mess. Did you tour nationally or just, just stay in the no, Northeast? We toured New England. We uh -huh. toured New England. Yeah. Had a, had a great time. Uh, but, and we had, you know, Boston Nights was uh, the song on the radio. Mm -hmm. I also, the, the first song I ever wrote was called Dreamin', and that's that's like the B-side of Boston Nights. And uh, this uh, friend of somebody in the band got a call from the producer in New York City for the band In Excess. And they heard my song Dreamin'. I didn't send it to you, but it's on my CD 80s. They wanted to record it. I mean, I'm thinking, man, you know, In Excess wants to record it's the first song I wrote. Okay, but, well, you know what? The band got into a fight about who had the copyright on the song Dreamin'. I wrote it. And I was so full of myself back then. This is in the 80s. I said, you know what? 
I own the copyright. Somebody else in the band wanted half of the shares. And I was so stupid. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes I made. I said, it's my song. I want the credit. Nobody's going to record it unless I get the credit for being the songwriter. So the song didn't go anywhere. Oh, wow. Look at as far as the flip side of B night or Boogie uh, Boston Nights, I guess, right? Yeah, it's the it's on the other side. You can hear it on my uh, CD eighties. But uh -huh. I could I could kick myself in the butt every day for doing that stupid thing. So don't be oh, like, don't be so selfish that you uh, you know so insecure that you think that's the last great song you're going to have. Just give it away if you have to, just to get some exposure like tom is giving me today how cool is that <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna go somewhere i just threw a complete blank now <laughs> you threw me off with that i'm just i'm used to this being about you <laughs> so, now, hey you know it's both of us here this is how why it's working you know it takes two right so At least the, two. Yeah. the first song we're going to listen to is boston night this was when you were with that band then right yeah and um, yeah and actually i did not write boston nights truth be told the guy that wanted credit for my song dreaming is the one that wrote this song boston nights well i'll be doing and so wow. I, maybe there's a this is kind of a yin and yang thing or or uh, a you, karma know, thing. you know i guess now that we're older we're mature we don't care we just you know the music is out there he even yeah. gave the song i'm a thank you michael capsalis if you're listening yeah. and um, yeah, and, and I didn't, I was really insecure then. He was going to Berkeley School of Music, Michael was. Oh, okay. And, uh, I didn't know, but they were recording me laughing. And, and I didn't know till after the song got released that instead of a guitar solo in the middle, where the, usually the guitar solo is, it's a, my laughing solo. I'm like, are you, you gotta be kidding me. And then, but then at the end, I actually used to play lead guitar and I'm playing lead at the end. So you can hear a little bit of my style at the end of this song, Boston Nights. Sounds great. Let's listen to it then. This is Deborah Cohen and the song is called Boston Nights. I should have known better. I should have put you in your place. I ran to the corner bar. I tried to get you most of the night. I just can't stand to be alone, but baby, when we're together, all we do is fight. I'm giving you just one more chance. I hope that we can see you through Don't give me none of your summer dance up, baby It'll be the end of you
What did you do during COVID? What was, because we never really finished your walk. We got as far as the band. Oh, okay. It's a was, long, it's a long walk. Well, yeah, because you're, you're like 30 now. Oh, yeah, times two. <laughs> times two. <laughs> That's funny. Funny, Tom. Uh, well, during COVID, actually, I had retired or left the uh, public school teaching. I got a day gig because I'm, I'll back up a little bit. When I, in the 90s now, I was in a blues band in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And I had an A&R guy that wanted to sign me, but when he met me in person, because I had a CD out uh, that's I don't have it released anymore, but he liked the songs. And uh, when I was sitting there, he's looking through his Rolodex. For those of you that know what a Rolodex is, he's spinning it. And I'm sitting there nervous as all hell because I've never had a record label interview before. And I'm thinking, OK, he's saying, uh, do you think your music would sound good with Margaret Becker or um to- what was her name? I can't remember her name. Anyway, uh, this is like the Christian music scene. I'm thinking to myself, why is he looking for somebody else to sing him, right? But I didn't have the guts at first to ask him. And I finally said, you know what? And he was only looking at me with his profile. He wasn't even talking to me eye to eye, which I think is so rude. People that don't look at you when they talk to you. It's like, yeah. okay. But anyway, I said, so I finally got up the guts and I said, uh, excuse me, whatever his name was. I'm singing the music. And there was like this long pause. And then he said, well, you know, uh, it's there's no such thing as an overnight success. Uh, it takes years of grooming. And I said, that's right. Here I am. I moved to Nashville. I quit my job as a postmaster up in Bailey Island, Maine to come down here and get famous. And he says, uh, well, you know, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get signed because you're too old. Oh, my God. Oh, he could have put a knife in my heart. That was the thing I was trying to hide. I had a little white lie. I was telling people I was in my 30s, but I was really in my 40s. <laughs> uh-huh. So I packed my bags and I thought, what am I going to do now? I'm an old lady, old husband. I know I'll be a public school teacher. So I went to college and I graduated from uh, TTU at the age of 50 and Spent the next 10 years in purgatory in a classroom, alternative high school. Kids had ankle bracelets on. I'm like, oh, my God, I must be insane. What am I doing? I finally had to leave because PTSD triggers. So that's when I went into yoga to put myself back together again. Uh So you asked me, what did I do during COVID? Starting in 2017, I was a yoga teacher for Silver Sneakers, old people like me. <laughs> but the first people to lose their jobs were the yoga teachers that teach old people like me because they get, you know, sick easy. And so that all the places closed. I lost my job. And I'm like, okay, over COVID, I had nothing else to do except making music, which I make, but I'd like to make a living at it, hint, hint. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't have any yoga classes for two years, put on a lot of weight, and now I'm out of shape, so I can't even get a teaching job, yoga. So I'm trying, still trying, six decades later, to make a living at what I love to do as a musician. And a lot of people, including my friends and family, don't realize the importance of what sharing, caring, subscribing, reposting, all those things, streaming, like how many how many streams does it take for the artist to be able to buy one t-shirt? Maybe like 5,000 or is it 10,000 streams? Do you know, Tom? Oh, I have no idea. Ah, yeah. <laughs> if I knew that, I would put it in a book. I'd sell the book at a dollar a piece and sell a million copies tomorrow. Ah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I I don't gig right now. uh, And my husband and I are moving to Clearwater, Florida. So I'm hoping to, you know, make a career out of my music down there. But yeah, so that answers your question anyway, as far as what I do during COVID. So down in Clearwater, when you're down there, will you do originals? Will you do covers? Because I I go to Florida every year. We hit that Clearwater, Tampa, uh, St. Pete area every every February we go down there. Oh, very cool. And yeah, it's wonderful because I'm in Vermont. So, you know, it's very oh, cool God. up here in February, <laughs> as you know. Aren't you having a water shortage up there? Or We're having everything but a water Fl- shortage. Or a, a flooding, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you okay? You got a boat oh, up there? We're, we're fine here. It's just the like Montpelier got really hit bad and a bunch of the surrounding towns around there. Oh. But anyways, my, so when we go to Florida, it uh, seems like there's every resort you stay at, there's like a, a one- 
one person entertainer. We'll go yeah. on Monday and it might be Tom Pollard. We go on Tuesday and it's Deborah Cohen. Then we might go on Wednesday. It's Tom Pollard, but this time he's with Deborah Cohen, you know. Oh, and, are you are you a musician? No, so, well, I, I own guitars. <laughs> Oh, you play them? <laughs> play, I play them. I play with them. I was in a band uh, back in St. Louis when I lived there. But uh, anyway, so the, the point is that the there's a lot of resorts there that have one and two person acts, but it seems like the emphasis is to be background at the bar, be background at the lounge. Uh, and the artists that I've talked to, every single one of them over the last, uh, especially during setting this up, the artists that I met through the years down there all said the same thing. It's all covers, all covers. Wow. Every and once in a while, one guy or two guys will say, well, we sneak one in like toward the end of our first set or second set. So how will that play for Deborah Cohen? Will you go down someplace and play, say, Hey, here's the deal. I'm playing just my stuff. And they say, well, we want Margaritaville. Oh, uh, well, you know what? I have to draw the line and say, look, be it's the Beatles or bust. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, seriously, I mean, I when I sing spiritually, I go to a higher place. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, you know, you, you know, at some point in your life, you have to ask yourself, every one of us, why am I here? And yes, I'm here to try to pay my bills. That's part of it. <laughs> You know, but, um, you know, I write songs from my dreams that, right. you know, that's something special. I don't know where it's taking me because, you know, we're all on a journey in this life. And part of it, you know, each one of us has gifts. So this is a gift I'm, be I'm being given in the spiritual realm. And, um, you know, thank God I have a husband that can pay the bills, but I'd like to be able to be self-supporting at some point. Yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, you know, if the right offer came along in Clearwater, um, I might consider it. But I don't think my husband would be too cool about me singing in a bar room. <laughs> <laughs> I said it like a Bostonian. They sound like some Boston there. <laughs> yeah, I know, like a bar room. Yeah, yeah back I, in the bar room, I'm going to go pack my can in the yard with Eddie Mac. <laughs> That's it. I know. But I had to learn how to speak, speak business English when I moved down south because people were looking at me so funny. And I'm like, they'd all ask, where are you from? And they'd say it like I'm from another planet. And I'm uh -huh. like, where are you? Where am I from? How about where are you from? You know, <laughs> I grew up in grew up in St. Louis and did my first radio gig. I did a late night talk show down in Joplin, Missouri. And down in Joplin, people talking like this here, you know. Oh yeah, and, with and the flag. So I made a comment about them having an accent, and one of the, my regular callers, we called him Karate Man, and he called me up and said, "Tom, reach in your pocket there. You got a you got a twenty five cent piece?" I said, "Yeah, I do." He says, "So, so what is this? It's a quarter." He goes, "No, spell it." I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Spell it." I said, "Q U A R." It's a quarter. <laughs> My whole life, I've been calling it a quarter. It's a quarter. I mean, come on, come on. What time is it? It's a quarter to 12. You know what are we doing? It's going to go at quarter after 11. We get again. It's a quarter. There's another R in there that I didn't even know about. <laughs> well, we say, we say in Boston, we say quarter. Quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Quarter past 12. You know, quarter. Quarter. Yeah. 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 Anyway. So right. we were talking about, and you brought this up again, about your spiritual life. Ah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. And that segues into the next song, which is an old traditional gospel song, Rock of Ages. Tell us your take on that and why Rock of Ages out of all the gospel songs to do. Why that one? Well, that's a good question, Tom, and I appreciate it. And actually, um, in my walk in spirituality, and hopefully I'm growing every day toward the light, I wanted to try to record a song that was, and this is a public domain song, actually. It's been around for a long time. It was actually written by a Jewish man, uh, and uh, that was very surprising because c most people think it's just a Christian song, but it's, yeah. it, and it could be Christian, but in, in Hebrew, it's Meod Tzor. That's the title of it in Hebrew, uh -huh. because it was, written, that's, it was written by a Jewish man, like I mentioned, Mordecai somebody so i i really would like to um just share the spiritual love that i feel when i sing for anybody that wants to listen so you know i went through this period um 
in Judaism where I only wanted to hang around with Jewish people. But I've just come to realize that we're all made by the same creator. And if you believe that, I would like to be able to share that love that we all have access to, to help people to get along together, if that's even possible. You know, Bob Marley had it right, you know, one love. But, you know, in order to get that kind of a high, you have to smoke pot. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I'm not endorsing that. I'm just saying, you know, could we just praise? Um, could we just remember why we're here? Could we just think about peace? And could we just listen and enjoy each other instead of saying I'm right and you're wrong? So I thought I would pick a song that would attract more than just one sect of religion. Do you know the... Jewish translation of Rock of Ages, or do you just know the English version? I know it, but not by heart. Okay. Yes. Because I, I, I just, that's, I was today years old when I found out it was written by a, a, a Jewish, Jewish author, a Jewish author. Yes, 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 yes. You can find out, just do a Google search. Yeah. You know, Mr. Google knows everything. Uh, just look for, uh, it's Mayo's, M as in Mary, A O Z. T Z U R. Look up the uh, story on the creation of that song, and you yeah. can find the words in Hebrew and English. Yeah, yeah. That would be cool. Uh, it's one of my my favorite. I went to a seder years ago, and that was one of my favorite songs. A woman got up and and sang El Shaddai. It sang it in Hebrew. Ah, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Ah, well, so you are you Jewish too? No, no. Oh, no. you just went no, to. A I went to a, no, no, but I did play Tevya when I was a junior in high school. Okay. Uh, All right. That, so I, I know a little bit about the Hebrew tradition. I was raised Catholic. And yes, so, so was I. There's a lot of overlap between our, and it's mainly about tradition, but that's a show for another time in a different yeah, format. That, yeah, yeah, that's cool. All right. Nice yeah, to so I want to hear the song, and I want to hear your version of it, so we're going to play it now. This is Deborah Cohen and her rendition of Rock of Ages.
Rock of Ages, Deborah Cohen, and I'm your host, Tom Pollard of the Music of America podcast. We'll be back to talk to Deborah in a moment. B Normous Productions have been producing and recording music and videos for over 20 years. After years as a performer, the owner, Ven Verhoeven, decided to get back to that which he loves most, production. After tutelage under Jordan Valeria, he opened up his own place in Millican, Colorado. High-end instruments and high-end tools are on hand to make you sound as good as you can, to make your sound compete with that of your favorite records and albums. He has one goal in mind, and that's for you to look and sound as professional as possible. So go make some records. Go make some videos at B Normus Productions. They're on Facebook, or you can find them at bnormusproductions.com. Which makes me, Deborah, ask about the video era. You remember the song Video Killed the Radio Star. Did you do video when you were, because video was hot when you were, or just coming up, it was gaining a lot of heat or a lot of momentum and growth at the time that you were performing. You mean like in the 80s? In the 80s, 90s, yeah. Did you? Yeah, do I mean, there were people making videos of me and I wish I had them. But, you know, in the, in the middle of my party world, they got yeah. lost. Somebody else ended up getting them. I don't know where they where they went. I've got a few black and white remnants of me on stage, which I'll post on my social media uh-huh. every Thursday for uh, what is it? Throwback Thursday. Oh, right, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm not get some pictures that I wouldn't publish. <laughs> now, now you brought up the the Beatles as a big influence. What yeah. female vocalist or female performers inspired you? You're a blues woman, so Janice had to been in there. Well, yeah, Janis Joplin for sure. I mean, she's a heart tugger. And uh, Mahalia Jackson, uh, I yeah. loved her. I loved um, Bonnie Raitt. Bonnie Raitt was probably the one where I, I cut my teeth on the blues with her. Yeah. Uh, I knew what, the first time I heard Mariah Carey sing, I knew she was going to be uh, hit, a hit before she was ever known. I heard her once and I just knew she can sing from her heart and there might have been a few others but i can't remember their names because it's been a few decades <laughs> well, it <laughs> happens to us when you get to be our age you know <laughs> it's for another show i can tell you that's, that's new right. medicine i ordered that's supposed to help bring my hearing back <laughs> what is your vocal styling sim- or who is your vocal styling similar to you know, I mean, if that's an interesting question because whenever I create some kind of a site online, they ask, who do you sound like? And I'm like, I've never been able to figure out who I sound like. I sound like me. I mean, you know, like I have probably three octave, four octave range. I can get uh-huh. down there with oh, really low and I can get up there oh, way, up, way up high. So I, I wish I could say I sounded like Kate Bush, but she's a lot more polished than me. So. <laughs> I think Ann Wilson, maybe, um, okay. and, uh, you know, some people, like, I get a lot of um, solicitations online to advertise my music on black channels, and okay. I think I think when they don't see me, they think I'm a black chick singing, which is really, it's a compliment, because, you know, hey, I also grew up with the Supremes, yeah. so, you know, uh, who's the one that sang... Tell me something good. Shaka Khan. Yeah, her. You know, she was really. And I love D-Light. Grooves in ya. You know, I just, I'm all over the place. Blondie, you know. I guess you could say I sound like Blondie. And I used to get mad when people told me I look like her. I was so foolish. But anyway. Well, Boston Nights, actually, that's who I, I thought of. I thought if you have to have a, a vocal identity in that song, that's who I paired you with, was Blondie. Blondie? Yeah, yeah. That, that see, that's cool. I, it's a compliment now, but I was so wanting to be original in the yeah. '80s that I I didn't want to say that. And I saw I sound like I sound like me. Yeah, right. you know? but we the, all do. We all the do. me thing, right? Yeah. So now, the next song we're going to talk about, she he, you, you say is sync. Yeah, right? it's, it's for it's it's sync music, and let me, I'll put my glasses on so I can read my own lyrics because you know sometimes you know. I can remember all the words of the Beatles songs, but when it comes to mine, I can't, I can't remember them. But uh, sync music is uh, to appeal to somebody that's shopping for music for TV, film, or movies. And so, how does that, how, just look, look I'm going to yeah. stop you as we go, because this is all new to me. 
Okay. So there's somebody that's just sitting at a desk in LA or New York or something, and he just watches videos and listens to tunes and watches videos and listens to tunes. Well, you know, they work with editors, uh, but they're called music supervisors and they uh-huh. buy music for, let's say, for example, I, there is a, I would love to have this song on the next series of Blue Bloods. If you're listening, <laughs> this might be something for you. So, you know, you find that you, you have to rub elbows with the right people and I don't know them yet. So, yeah. Yeah, or music libraries, they're, they're also, you know, the artists will apply, you have to make a CD like or an EP of similar genre music and put it on there and submit it to the music library. They'll listen to it, they like it, then, you know, and if you're lucky, you get hired. But you have to be good enough to be able to make a song within a week if that, if, you know, because they need the stuff right away. So you have to be able to do it all yourself. That's why I am a DIY artist. Do it yourself. Yeah. Sing, sing yourself. Make your own instrument playing. Use your own software MIDI. Mix it and master it and spit them out and send them a WAV file or whatever they need for the show. There's a show that you've probably seen called Sons of Anarchy. But, uh, not, it's not a, about a motorcycle club out in California. Oh, okay. And Katie Seagal is the matriarch of the the family that, that basically this loosely parallels Oedipus or something. And uh, uh, But the music in there, a lot of it is Katie Seagal. But uh-huh. a lot of it is, uh, it's background, but it... Uh, and I use a word I use a lot in this podcast of late is texture, and that oh. music adds texture to not just the show but to a particular scene. Right. There's a buddy of mine, or a guy that I, I shouldn't say buddy of mine, but a guy that I knew years ago when he worked at Guitar Center in St. Louis, oh. a gentleman by the name of Mike Zito, who's tearing it up in West Texas. He's a great blues rocker. Okay. Oh. And in one of the episodes, he's being played on the radio in the truck in the background as the guy's walking away from the truck. But if he didn't have that song on in the background, as this guy's walking away from the truck, that scene just seems kind of dead. Yes, of course. And that's what sync music is. That is support- I've never thought of that before. Yes, it supports the conversation or the dialogue of the actor. So uh-huh. the whole thing is your words really matter much when you're writing it because you got to pitch it for a certain scene. You yeah. know, so this particular song, She, He, is, is about, you know, it can be different things. I wrote it in a spiritual plane from a biblical book called The Song of Songs. But if you listen to the lyrics, you could also think it's about two um, two people meeting, man and a woman, and co- conjugate conjugating together. Is that the word? It is today. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's plenty of that in the TV. I mean, I'm not going to pitch my stuff to write it X or even our stuff but you know it just seems like you get those kind of scenes even in pg music movies today yeah yeah well uh with what's going on with with genderism right now and pronouns etc a song called she he just on the title alone is going to raise some eyebrows i hope so i hope was that by design well um i don't know i just kind of i think It just, it's another one of them dream songs that came to me and I started listening to it and I I wrote, she is coming to my mind. She speaks to me in love. And so she's, it's a she description. And then it goes, he is coming into view. He, I think I will talk to, you know, he's Uh here to be on word. He brings song that I have heard. And I actually dedicated this song to uh, Robert Plant. One of my favorite singers, Led Zeppelin, because he contacted me on TikTok chat. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I I just was like beside myself. I had to tell my girlfriend, hey, uh, do you think this is really Robert Plant? She said, get a video chat going with him so you can prove it's him. Uh Because there's a lot of scammers out there. You don't know how many people, maybe you do, how many people there are out there that claim to be Robert Plant. I mean, you know. So anyway, he arranged for me to talk with him on WhatsApp. And he was telling me and that um, his management would not appreciate him contacting me. He doesn't communicate with his followers. 
So I'm not saying 100% was him. I did see him in a video. It was him. I got two pictures of him that he sent to me. And but I had to drop it because it was driving me crazy. I I wasn't sure if it was him or not, because after that, a couple more Robert plants were, were writing to me. And I didn't know which one was the real Robert plant. But so anyway, if the real Robert plant is listening, <laughs> this song is dedicated to you, my friend. That's great. Well, let's give it a listen. Deborah Cohen's song, She He on the Music of America podcast.
She, He with Deborah Cohen. And Deborah, before we say goodbye, this is the segment of the show we call Shameless Self-Promotion. This is where you help us monetize everything that you have done. So tell us where we can hear you, find you, see you, support you, buy your stuff. Oh, well, Tom Pollard, I want to thank you. Give a shout out. And I hope that you get a lot of followers on your show. And I thank you for contacting me. So if anybody wants to hear my music, I'm trying to release a song, a single every month with an instrumental track. So, you know, like if you're a music supervisor or a music library and you're looking for fresh sound, here I am. Uh, <laughs> also, also, have you heard of Bandcamp? The Bandcamp Friday, they're very good. They started this during COVID. So all sales of digital music at Bandcamp. And the URL is Deborah, D-E-B-R-A, Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, music.bandcamp.com. All of the proceeds for the sales of the music, the first Friday of every month, go to the artist. Yeah. And so whoever your favorite artist is, even if it's not me, make sure you go there the first Friday of every, every month. And also, this is the second annual event for something called Band Shirt Day. This is the second big deal where even signed famous artists are in on it. And so you buy the T-shirt. So the artists are designing a T-shirt for you to wear on September 15. Yes, September 15, 2023. And yes, I have a T-shirt designed. And where do you get it? Ah, it's at redbubble.com. And I don't have my own URL. So you just have to go to redbubble.com and search for Deborah, D E B R A, Cohen, C O H E N. And please follow me on Spotify because I need a lot more streamers and I don't have the money to pay somebody a couple hundred bucks just to get some real followers. And lastly, don't forget to subscribe to me on my YouTube channel. And it's really easy to find. Just look for at Jewish Rock Music. So <laughs> thank you very much. I got to say this because I didn't say this at the beginning. And I, maybe I should have. I don't know. This is audio only. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Deborah's being so animated and playing to the camera so well. And I I, I usually say that before we, we begin this. Just... That's okay. I probably still wouldn't be like that. I talk with my hands. You the know? energy is wonderful and we appreciate well, thank it. You. Thank you. Deborah, good luck to you. And that wraps up our week in Georgia. Join us next week. The Music of America podcast heads to Hawaii. You've been listening to the Music of America podcast. If you like today's show, please go to the website at www.musicofamericapod.com or our Music of America podcast Facebook page. Like us and follow the show and episodes. We tally the votes of all our shows, and the most listened to shows will be rebroadcast on our best of shows at the end of the season. I look forward to having you with us again and listening to the Music of America.